We sit down with internationally respected attorney Daryl Levitt and we discuss how he started his career in Johannesburg, South Africa and how from those humble beginnings he was able to build a career enabling him to work with clients all over the world. If you are looking for inspiration, motivation and advice on how to grow your career internationally and how to take advantage of what operating on virtually every continent has to offer. This one is for you. Welcome to Coffee and Conversations with Champions, the Leadership Edition. Yeah, I want to say, Daryl, thank you for uh, coming on the show. Um, really appreciate it. It's also been great to reconnect because we've, uh, we've known one another for a substantial amount of time. We're, uh, we're not youngsters. I mean, you look fantastic. And uh, appreciate that. Uh, yeah, no, really, it's awesome to see. So, um, if you want to just give us a little bit of a background, I'm very excited to have you on because we're going to chat about immigration, you know, maybe South Africa in the 90s, what the idea was, and sort of where you sort of um, see your career going, what you're wanting to do, what you built up, because you built up quite a substantial practice and a reputation for yourself. And um, just really, you know, may for those listening, particularly the youngsters starting out, or really, you know, anyone wanting to make a change. Um, I don't know what, who the, the oldest law student at Wits University was, but um, I know I had a friend of mine's dad who was 54, and he went back and did an engineering degree. Uh, yeah. So, which is and quite... It's huh? Then it's normally engineering first and then law, which is... Yeah. Uh, kind of interesting that's that's crazy yeah so give us a quick rundown you're ben duffy who is daryl levitt perfect and thanks for having me on your podcast mm. um so i uh, started my my career in law in south africa qualified mm. as a lawyer and we were doing a lot of litigation at the time that i was practicing um, litigation, a lot of uh, family law, but also corporate litigation. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after, after qualifying uh, and, and having done my articles and qualified, uh, for a period of time I worked as an associate and then moved into investment banking uh, mm -hmm. with a wealthy industrialist, a German industrialist called Dieter Bock and Neil Bernstein who you probably will know from Cape Town. Mm -hmm. And we did some transactional work. Uh, we were contracted to do their corporate finance uh, advisory uh, for transactions in Africa up to 100 million rand, which at the time was quite substantial. I think it's not really a lot of money anymore. Uh, but It's about $14, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, and change. Yeah. <laughs> and then... Um, Really, I'd always seen the U.S. as being a place where, you know, the old saying, um, it's the American dream. Mm. And for, fortuitously, I actually got my green card and went to, I started in the U.S. in New York and stayed there for a while, moved between New York and Los Angeles. And then my mother got sick mm. and they were living, my parents were living in New Zealand at the time. So we just, I decided to come back to South Africa and just ensure that she had um, good treatment. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a period of time, I stayed back in South Africa uh, and then decided to give Canada a chance. Actually, funny enough, I wanted to stay in the US, but my girlfriend at the time wanted to move to Canada. So we moved to Canada. And then she said, you know, I actually want to go back to South Africa, but I'd already got a job. And interestingly, my first day on the job uh, was flying to South Africa to open the Janusburg sure. office of okay. Faskin with a few sure. other people. Hmm. So, and then uh, stayed at Faskin for a few years, five years, I think it was, um, helped build the practice in Johannesburg. Um, move, was recruited by a firm called McLeod Dixon, which uh, had offices and operated more in um, Kazakhstan, Moscow, uh, Caracas, Venezuela, um, 
all the difficult places or places mm -hmm. that would not be really a focus for Western firms and stayed there for a few years until it merged with Norton Rose. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I stayed at Norton Rose for a good few years and left about four or five years ago to stop my own practice. Okay. So that's, that's from a high level, uh, what I've kind of marked the trajectory of my career. So I think it, it, you, you've covered a lot of bases. And I think in the times that we've spoken, you've never really sort of been too worried about, you know, settling into one place, doing the traditional thing. Because I think one could have very easily sort of moved to New York, set up base there and felt, well, this is the best place in the world to be and build a career. And you, you've got quite a global view. And I think if we can just sort of chat about that, what is sort of like New York, LA, the South Africa, then to Canada, then working in with all of these these different regions, what has that given you in a work experience? And uh, why 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 do you think why was it it was a great idea to do it? You know, and uh, you know. so going into all these different places. Uh, gave me access to a network of people that mm. ordinarily one wouldn't have access to those people if you just remained in South Africa. Um, South Africa has got a very um, robust community of business people. However, we all know that capital are required for developing, whether it's mines, oil and gas, or, bu or businesses. When you want to go on a global scale, you have to tap capital outside South Africa. Mm -hmm. So it was always um, known to me that you would have to expand your your network, um, and I just I, I, it, it's amazing how many people uh, that that I met that were entrepreneurial, but also that were established not just entrepreneurial, but were established in their various sectors that uh, I, I, I had access to or eventually or, or made. Uh, contact with uh, that I have remained in contact with mm -hmm. uh, that, that um, have opened doors that, that there's no question would it mm -hmm. would it not have been available had I remained in South Africa okay so it's it's it's, it's all about connections and contacts not just what you know, you know your your law degree or your business degree but who you know right I think that that's such a valid point because even in New York or Los Angeles or Toronto, Vancouver, any of these established cities, it's a lot harder to get into the right circles because you've got so many people fighting to get into those circles. So have you found going to um, the the less uh well what's the word i'm looking for the places the, the walking on the less trodden path and going to regions that people aren't running to or flocking to have you found those entrepreneurs those business leaders are more willing to have a conversation they're more willing to meet uh, yes yes and no but mm -hmm. uh my experience my experience has been you know i went to north america and you say well i worked with with the following people in south africa and these are high profile people and they go who <laughs> um, who are they so yeah. you then get to realize that south africa in the greater scheme of things although we right. love south africa uh, in the mm. greater scheme of things is really a microcosm in the world mm. and that there's far bigger things outside south africa and in north america that you know just um the 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 idea of business is just so so much bigger outside mm -hmm. south africa now that being said um americans are more uh, open to meeting people that are outside from outside the u.s Okay. Can Canadians, Canadians tend to be more provincial in their in their approach to business people. It's more of an old school club. Okay. That's that's been my experience. But the US is more, you know, there's just so many more people uh, mm. in, in in business that they have to listen to you. They have to. Right. When I say they have to listen to you, it's just more 
open and embracing, whereas Canada is a little bit more trickier and difficult. Mm. Right. Is that what you, so when you say the club, it's literally the old country club, you know, and that, those type of connections. Yeah. Okay, 100%. That's right. Yeah. And, and to break into that, mm. uh, you it's, it's much more difficult than the U.S. market. Okay. And then how have you found sort of the U.S. relationships versus Canadian relationships? So are you able to go deeper and longer in America? Or where in Canada it's sort of for now and then you have to rekindle relationships? Or is it once it's a connection made, a connection is made? No, I think that's right. I think it's once it's for now, uh, you will keep that contact in Canada Mm. until something crops up and materializes. The U.S. is more direct. It's a more direct approach to not just uh, business but to life. Uh, it, it is, what can you offer me? Can you offer me something? What is it? Put it on the table. Mm. If it is, great, we move forward. If it's not, also fine, no problem. Um, that's, that's been uh, the U.S. approach. The Canadian approach is more kind of dilly-dallying and kind of touchy feel for a while. Mm. And it, something may materialize. Just for, I, found, I found it easier to do business mm. in the U.S., Right, but Canada not 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 to say that Canada isn't a great place to do business. It's just harder. So I think for, to use a South African term, it's like Johannesburg versus Cape Town. Uh, Pre- yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah, I'd, I'd give that a. That's right. I'd yeah. say that's quite appropriate. Yeah. You know, decisions are made a lot quicker in Joburg. People are happy to meet Cape Town. It's like you, you know, really want to build that as you said, build that relationship. Very very touchy feely. So where are some of the interesting places you've, uh, you've worked and you've traveled to? So some of the interesting places have been uh, Latin America's, mm. you know, Mexico, Colombia. Um, Colombia is a fascinating place. Right. It used to be, it used to be uh, associated with a lot of the the drug running in mm-hmm. Latin America, but in actual fact, Colombia has cleaned up its act. Uh, there are more issues relating to drugs in Mexico than there, than yeah. there is in uh, Colombia. So um, Colombia has presented a, a, a tremendous amount of opportunities in mining, mm-hmm. in uh, cannabis uh, industries. I don't, I'm not in the cannabis sector, but um, we did, I did advise a a cannabis company that had operations in Colombia uh, and that eventually did go public. But for mm. the most part, I'm not in that sector. Uh, it's just doing the securities and corporate commercial work. Right. Uh, but from a mining perspective, uh, Colombia, Mexico is fascinating, uh, mm. has a lot of opportunities in Mexico, Brazil. The big uh, behemoth in mm. Latin America is also another fascinating place I've been to. And um, so Latin America is one of my favorite places uh, to travel and do business. I've also been to Hong Kong for board meetings, which is right. great. You, you know, you can have fun. They take you yeah. to the mm. jockey club. Mm, mm. Uh, they take you all over. I, I've had a lot of uh, interesting business um, meetings. In, right. in Hong Kong. Do, yeah. Did you and, stay at the Dorchester? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, yeah the, Dor- the, the Dorchester, the clean one, the good one. The clean one. Yeah, yeah. Not, the, not our one. <laughs> not, not the one in Hillbrow, I think it not is. Not the one in Hillbrow. Uh, <laughs> Hotel um, Coronel. Um, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, then, yeah. and then Russia. Russia mm. also before, before the... I'm talking in the early 2000s uh, was was great also uh, so i've made a lot of good contacts along the way so I think if we, if we touch on that now and then i want to sort of look at your sort of views um you know where the world is moving where you seeing opportunity give us a little bit of a, a background and a rundown on your your firm your practice what do you do who are your clientele and sort of you know for guys are looking to to get in touch, what what are the services that you offer? So my, it's it's, it's quite funny how my career 
actually mm. started here in law is that I was interviewing um, and one firm uh, was opening the office in South Africa, Faskin, and I had interviewed there and the partners sat around asking me questions. Well, do you know De Beers? Yeah, I know De Beers. Oh, okay. So you must be a mining lawyer. So they put me into the mining <laughs> group and said, should they be a mining lawyer? Yeah. And, and so from a mining finance perspective, mm. uh, that's where, that's where, that's, uh, that's where I, I, I cut my teeth. Okay. Um, so it would not, not necessarily the dirt part of mining as in a dirt lawyer, mm -hmm. but, uh, financing project finance and, um, you know, RPOs, taking companies public, doing private equity deals, mostly natural resources. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I've done, uh, is you could say that I'm a corporate finance lawyer because I have advised on transactions that are not mining related done a lot of mining work, mm -hmm. uh, but have advised on financings within sovereign, I've advised sovereign funds, I've advised um, companies that have um, merged. I was one of the lawyers on the Petro Canada Sunco merger, which was the largest merger in Canadian history. That was $55 billion. Sure. Uh, um, mm -hmm. You know, I've, we've done financings, I've advised on financings. In fact, in, into South African mines, uh, north of $200 million on each transaction, and some of the smaller transactions. You know, uh, guys that came across some interesting platinum projects, mm -hmm. uh, we would advise on joint ventures and, and earnings. So my practice has, it has developed into a corporate finance practice. Right. So you have a you have a company or a uh, that's looking to expand, needs capital. Uh, we have built up good reputations and networks in London mm -hmm. and Toronto and the U.S. Okay, particularly in those um, areas. So, uh, and when the company is ready to go public, we'll take them public, whether it's in London or Canada, or we'll use associates in um, in the U.S. to assist. Okay. So. Uh, and then f from time to time, Nick, we'll do some um, public interest work. Uh, the Ethiopia air disaster, we represented the whistleblowers in that case. We do a lot of the whistleblower work uh, mm -hmm. because typically when there's, um, when there's whistleblowing, uh, the first thing that one can expect is a company to retaliate and say, you know, these whistleblowers are grieved employees now whistleblowing is far more dangerous in south africa though we don't do any of that in south africa yeah. at all uh we're not interested in in doing that um, mm. but in canada from time to time to the extent that you have a public interest issue like uh, the the max the problems with the max aircraft mm -hmm. which has impacts uh, which globally uh, yeah. on people taking aircraft um, that would be a matter that we would take on, and we did take on, um, and we we got the reports to the FBI and the FAA and all the relevant authorities uh, to at least um, have the regulators look into what is going on with this MCAS system. Mm, mm. And um, so we think that... It's, it's, it was a very worthwhile exercise because probably and most likely a flight is flying an aircraft, flying in an aircraft, at least the yeah. max aircraft is a lot safer now. Yeah. That, so that was literally saving lives. And, yes. You know, and I think also protecting reputations of airlines because, you know, a lot of the airlines um, pride themselves on, you know, a low... I mean, it's a difficult thing to say, but a low crash uh, re record. Um, I think that was with South African Airways where we had the Helderberg. Prior to that, it was the That's Comet right. that was in the 50s. So, yeah, okay. Unbelievable. And then, mm? yeah, and then um, also from a corporate malfeasance point of mm -hmm. view where corporations engage in misconduct and fraud, 
Um, we do, from time to time, get involved in investigations where we are commissioned to do a forensic, a legal forensic examination mm -hmm. into the, the financial affairs or the disclosure records of public companies um, and private companies, but where there are significant um, significant uh, investor investor bases and maybe even pension funds involved. So we've sure. done a couple of those uh, right. very high profile ones. Okay. The, it doesn't come without mm -hmm. it doesn't come without risk because inevitably one gets sued in these yeah. uh, in the, in these uh, types of situations. But we've come to learn to navigate uh, and expect that as that's part and parcel of the work. Okay, as sort of the the counter attack, as it were. Correct. So, for, where do you sort of see the future of um, the work that you're doing? So are you going more global? Are you staying sort of within these regions or you know, go, going up uh, into Africa, into Eastern Europe? Where are you seeing opportunities? So I've been coming back to South Africa. It's probably my fifth time this year. Uh, and I, uh, I see tremendous opportunities in mm -hmm. Africa. I think Africa is, and I've been saying it for a while, that it's the untapped uh, continent. It's got, a, it, it, it's, there's a large income disparity uh, that we know of. Mm. But you've, when I look at just South Africa, I mean, you've got tremendous brain power in mm. AI, tremendous brain power in fintech. Mm. Uh, so you've got these guys that have, uh, entrepreneurs uh, that are struggling to find work. So they're, forced to develop technology and business ideas uh, to create the opportunities for themselves and not rely mm. on businesses to employ them. And I've just in, in my recent travels have come across a lot of people that have these phenomenal ideas that if they went to London or engage people like myself mm. to assist them to tap equity or debt in uh, London, Canada, the U.S., uh, that'd be superstars, mm, mm. you know, so, but it's also educating these people uh, about how you have, how you utilize other people's money. You can't just take it and spend it as you wish. Right. You've got to be educated um, to use it responsibly and, and use it for the purpose that it's intended. Right. A hundred percent. Because also, I mean, that it, every, every customer or every potential client is also a representative of the culture in South Africa. And if yeah. things go, too many projects go badly, it can affect the, um, the view on the country for, of, of our entrepreneurs. And it's such a, you know, it's a great point that you make because um, and one of my favorite things growing up in South Africa is always you think of, no, we need to do a township fix, you know, where it's really these guys building these incredible things, you know, seeing the kids with using a, a tire and two sticks as a motorbike or building a car out of wire as a toy to having an old Nissan 1400 engine powering a shop. You know, the, the ingenuity due to lack of resources is unbelievable here. And that mindset is yeah. filtering through now. So... I think if there are guys, what, what are the sort of sectors that you're looking at? So fintech mm. is, is the sector that I think South Africa is way ahead uh, of other jurisdictions. Uh, there's some really interesting uh, concepts that are being mm -hmm. developed. Um, mining, mining in South Africa is difficult because South Africa has a perceived, um, whether, whether it's perceived or real, mm. it's certainly um, un, un, uh, un, underappreciated in the sense of, and misunderstood in terms of a political instability. So right. um, we'll just touch on mining for a second. Mm -hmm. um, mining, uh, there, there are similar jurisdictions there are ju jurisdictions with similar projects in Latin America, meaning they've, they've got 
you know, equivalent resources uh, in Mexico mm. and in Colombia that offer the same kind of returns. Uh, but because of the political or perceived political instability in South Africa, you, you have to apply a, a discount for political uh, uncertainty, mm -hmm. uh, which is which which means that you have to give away more of your project uh, for the same amount of equity than you would okay. if you were operating in Mexico or Colombia. Um, and it's it's also the fact that they still have to South Africa still has to kind of button down the ideas of corruption mm -hmm. uh, things you know where where the and uh, where, where, where there are people operating in offices that provide permitting and what have you uh, it's just it's it's really got to be cleaned up and buttoned down for mm. south africa to be taken for real right again um so i'm um, my observations have been in fintech uh, the some of the best um uh sectors and bricks and mortar businesses mm. in south africa mm. are just it's low-hanging fruit Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is you've got guys that are 75 years old. They, they, their children don't really want to remain in the business. Mm. Um, and these businesses, equivalent businesses, would be sold for 50 to 75% more in North America sure. than, than you would in South Africa. So bricks and mortars businesses mm. we love. Mm -hmm. We just, that's that industry um obviously depending on what sector but we're, we're not only new new uh, generation um business in other words bricks and mortar right. is, mm. is is still a flavor of the day it's got hard assets that you can value you can probably scale a lot of these businesses mm. outside south africa so you've got exposure to dollar earnings um so when you ask me how my practice is evolving and what I'm good for. It really is a combination of law yes. and bank, which has been my background, investment banking. Yeah. So we do private equity. I'm involved right. in private equity deals myself. Yeah. So uh, that's phenomenal. And I think, you, you know, it's such a wonderful thing to hear that on the bricks and mortar side. And I wanted to go, I'll go back to the mining. So I've got a question on that as well. But it's, th this is the time where we're seeing sort of, I think the last of the boomers is pretty much retiring. So it is those old 75, even 80-year-old, 60-year-old guys that are looking to step down. Maybe the kids aren't even in the country. And it right. is such a great opportunity for them to utilize that asset and that resource that they've, um, you know, that they've spent a lifetime building rather than just shutting the doors and selling off the assets. Yes. So, what, yes. what would and we the, love those? Yeah, yeah. What would that that sort of that step be? I mean, how would how would someone who had, you know what, I've got this business, we want to get in touch? Absolutely. So, I mean, you have to, mm. you could uh, look online, uh, mm. um, contact you for my yeah, details. Yeah, hundred. I'll put them uh, as well. Yeah, every YouTube video uh, we'll put them in the description. <laughs> ah, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Um, but we would t would we would look at wh whether the business is is mature mm. or whether it's actually still got runway, whether you can scale that business, uh, whether you can, and what the exit mechanism is, because you never go into mm. um, uh, an investment without an exit mechanism. Yeah. So we would look at, and that's from a private equity perspective. Mm -hmm. and we do fifty percent law. Or at mm. least me talking about me, I do fifty percent law and fifty percent business. Okay. Uh, and yeah, uh, they could get in touch, and we would see. We would do an analysis. Mm. Uh, I have uh, people that I work with uh, on financial analysis as well, and then you take a view. Is this something that a company, a high growth? entrepreneur wants to raise money and get mm -hmm. legal advice because we're not we're not investment we don't offer investment advice we're mm. lawyers at the end of the day yeah so myself and my associates but um we would look at is this a type of business that wants to raise money using capital markets in london or canada 
or the US, or is this a private equity deal where we can syndicate or put our own money into it uh, and, and or syndicate with a view to growing it and then exiting down the road through a listing or, or an outright sale? Hundred percent. You know, so I just when we're talking, I have I, you know, the the fifteen years I spent in insurance, I worked with a lot of these businesses from manufacturing to, you know, like really high end manufacturing stuff like substations, and where it's an old Greek guy, and he's now in yeah. his eighties and still running the. And there isn't really the the extra the exit strategy was always my sons will take over the business, but yes. now they're no longer in the country. So you've got this factory with these staff, with these highly skilled laborers or workers, and uh, no no plan. So okay, I mean that, that's no a succession fantastic plan. Picture. Absolutely, yeah, no, no succession planning. Yeah, no. Well, the succession plan doesn't match the value of the opportunity. Yeah, inevitably, yeah. inevitably, mm-hmm. yes, and mm-hmm. that's why I see it as low hanging fruit because the valuations right. that owners are willing mm-hmm. to accept. Yeah. Because uh, you say to me, what's a business worth? A business is worth whatever somebody's willing to pay right. at the end mm. of the day. Uh, so the, there is a, a, a value discrepancy between mm. similar businesses in South Africa compared to other jurisdictions. That's why I say I've never seen opportunities like I'm seeing now. No. Okay. And a fantastic time. With, with, with a, a view on mining, and I think. If we go back to the early 90s, uh, when South Africa had its first elections, we opened up to the world. We were the world's darling, uh, rainbow nation. You know, there was a lot of investment coming in. We have every music artist in the world wanting to come and play here. And then that has slowly fallen away and eroded and, and been looted effectively. You know, and I think internationally, the view of the country is... You know, maybe it's not a place you want to do business, not a place you want to invest uh, from a stability and a corruption point of view. If that's cleared up, looking at a 20-year view or a 25-year view, if that's cleared up, do you think there, there is potential for growth here still? It's, it's going to take a generation of mm. politicians to clean this up. Right. Um, most people that are... Sp- that I've spoken to on my recent travels to South Africa mm. expressed the same concern. Corruption is the biggest um, issue uh, that's collapsing the country. Mm. And so um, it, it, it needs to be, I think the culture of compliance really mm-hmm. needs to be driven home for South Africa to be competitive again. Mm. Um, mm. When you say 20 years, yes, uh, I, I, I won't make any political statements because I don't mm. have a political view yet. Mm. Uh, and, and living in, in Kenya, I can, I can only speak about the, how we view South Africa, that's all. Right. Uh, but it, it, it's certainly from, from the discussions that I've had, it's going to take at least a generation of thinkers and, and mm. people that understand when you you're stealing essentially mm. when you're stealing f- and you committing corruption you're actually taking from the community you're not just taking yeah. from a state entity yeah right that state entity belongs to the people essentially yeah. you're stealing so, from future generations absolutely and it's yeah. not the the the, the mm. extent of corruption in south africa is on a scale unlike any other country Mm. So it's not just 10 million rand that you that that's that's people are stealing. It's billions of rands. Right. And then it's like, well, I'll go before a commission. I'll try and justify, you know, what it is and and what it. The point being, if that Mm. is cleaned up, South Africa has great runway. Right. uh, For business people and for Mm. flow of capital. the one thing that I will say is uh, from a, from a, I guess, when South Africa did end apartheid and it was the darling of the world, mm. it still was in, in, in that era um, uh, aligned with Western values. Mm-hmm. 
And right now, what we're observing is the world has become polarized and South Africa has aligned itself more towards Eastern, you know, mm-hmm. middle, let's say the, and again, I don't, I, I'm not passing any judgments or, or, or views or anything like that, but let's put it this way. It's antithesis mm. to Western values, opposite to Western mm-hmm. values. So if it were to want to attract Western capital, that's just becoming harder. However, mm, mm. Um, it's it it doesn't it it it's probably opening itself up for capital to come from China, Russia, mm-hmm. uh, India, from from the BRIC nations, mm. um, as opposed to the 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 usual suspects on the street, the UK, mm. Canada. Mm. As South Africa moves in that direction, you can expect. South Africa to, to South African businesses to obtain capital more from BRIC nations. Right. So, but um, you know, and for me, I'm I'm the eternal optimist because I believe if you develop resilience, you can be optimistic. And I think we yeah. we're an incredibly resilient people. And I so there is a there is a chance, you know, we're turning things around that there is an opportunity for capital inflow for investment and for growth that would far outstrip what has been taken out of the pot through corruption. Yeah, you know? but, but, you, but that corruption is a major yeah. sore point. And until that's actually addressed and punished, mm. yeah. um, then you, it, it, South Africa is just going to lag. Mm. Uh, mm. So certainly from a Western perspective, it's going to lag. It's not going to be of major interest. Right. You're going to have to have an f- extremely compelling story to attract capital. Mm. Uh, so, to attract foreign capital from from the UK and uh, Canada. But mm. just touching on that point, mm-hmm. um, the UK is more culturally aligned with South Africa than what Canada is. Right. And from a, from a business perspective, given the time zones, the history of uh, the UK um, uh, with South Africa politically, mm. um, Canada's interest in in South Africa or Canadian investor interest in South Africa is probably limited to mining at okay. this stage. Uh, and but again, like I said, you'd have to have a very compelling business case. Uh, because similar projects are are available in, mm. in places in Latin America. So again, uh, political discount in your deals, uh, but mm. you can still get capital from uh, from foreign investors. The UK more than the than uh, Canada at this point. Right. Okay. I think one of the things that also that I've noticed a bit is, you know, South Africa becomes the kickoff point for Africa. Uh, if that may, where you have perhaps foreign companies coming, basing their staff here because of infrastructure, healthcare, telecoms at the moment, and then going yes. up. The families are here at the school, kids are here at the schools, usually in the Cape or wherever, and then. They're doing business up into Africa. So we don't really want to lose the opportunity and the potential. I mean, we can share this with the rest of the continent, but it's not only are we languishing, but we're, we're slipping back and losing out on opportunities. Interesting point, actually, mm. because uh, we've seen countries like Namibia and mm. Botswana to very solid uh, jurisdictions to do business. Uh, right. We've only had very good uh, working uh, results in Botswana. Mm-hmm. Uh, we think Namibia is a good jurisdiction, but mm-hmm. Botswana is just phenomenal. Um, but the one other sector in South Africa that works is the medical sector. Phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Just absolutely, absolutely brilliant, mm-hmm. world class. Yeah. Here, if I wanted to go for an operation, I wanted to get medical treatment, you know, it's free. Mm. Uh, but you wait. And it's f- you, free at a you, price. <laughs> it's f- exactly, it's free mm. at a price. So as you get older, you, be, mm. you know, free healthcare becomes more relevant, but you need more, you need to be seen by specialists mm. probably sooner. And that's the good thing about South Africa. You know, mm-hmm. you've got a dual system. 
I'm not sure what this new system is, uh, how, how the new system of national health care is mm. going to work out. Uh, but for the time being, I mean, companies like Discovery Health, phenomenal, mm. brilliant, brilliant. The guys that are driving that company, mm -hmm. uh, Discovery, just phenomenal. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Very, and, like, and also good fingers like on the ground. Huh? Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So it, South Africa, I'm hopeful. I'm like you. I'm an optimist. I, yeah. I left. I left South Africa because I had opportunities here. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't leave because I felt the country was burning down. Right. Um, I've, I've always been optimistic about South Africa, and hopefully, mm -hmm. you know, I'm still. I'm, I'm still bullish. Yeah. I think you know one of the one of the views of people that I speak to worldwide is they say the ideal lifestyle is to live in Cape Town and earn in dollars or euros. You know, that yeah, they, yeah. They say that many of those people haven't experienced a Cape Town winter. But, <laughs> <you know? laughs> but I think that, you know, that is the thing. So if, if, we, if you were chatting to some young South Africans, you know, maybe go, let, let's break it into two groups. High school kids going into varsity potentially, or entrepreneurs, and then those sort of mid-20s to mid-30s. If we're speaking to the high school kids, what, what would the advice be that you would give them? And the reason I ask you this is like, you've lived a lot of life. You've done a lot of things. You worked in a lot of projects where you've seen, you know, that's the great thing with mining. You go, you, you're working with the, the guy who's underground to the guy who's designing the mine. You know, so yeah, it's okay. a very diverse range of the population. What advice would you be giving to sort of the high school kids? I think uh, expanding your expanding your uh, network outside South Africa is important. It's always important. It's going to open you up to lots of new ideas and also people that can execute and help you uh, right. get where you need to go or you want to go. Um, I highly recommend that whether it's spending a couple of years in Australia or mm -hmm. China or wherever you, you know, China is phenomenal. I we'll get right. on to that. Yes. Um, I, I highly recommend it. Now, if you're, if you're thinking of studying law, uh, and you, you're, you're thinking also that you might want to live outside South Africa more permanently, I would advise you to study law overseas. I would mm -hmm. not encourage you to study law in South Africa because you're going to have to do your LLB or BPROC or whatever degree you're going to study. You're going to have to convert your degree. So I had to convert my degree. I had to do equivalency exams. And it was the same as doing your LLB again because all the, the, system, the systems of law are completely mm -hmm. different. So if, if it's... Um, if it's a, um, uh, an, a sector that you're thinking of doing like, as I said, mining, oil and gas, mm. no problem, go, go outside the country. If it's law, not even a question, you must go and mm -hmm. study where you think you're going to live. Um, and then uh, I, I would say, Pick a, pick a jurisdiction that's stable uh, if, you, if you are going to go outside South Africa. Um, the U.S. is, although it's, it's a big behemoth, you, you, there are maybe um, easier jurisdictions to uh, study and, and um, make a living. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a full believer in just broadening your outlook and not just mm. kind of keeping a silo uh, mindset of Africa or South Africa. Right. And I think, you know, the kids have such amazing access to the world where, you know, every high school kid should have a LinkedIn profile, you know, and, and, and reach out and connect yeah. with, you know, just send direct messages. See, I'm old. I don't say DM. It's a direct message. Uh, <laughs> What yeah. do we call it? A telex. There we <laughs> to, a fax. A fax, a fax. There we go. A facsimile. Uh, to, <laughs> yeah. You know, and me message 20 business leaders a day, a night. Just, hey, this is who I am. and uh, you know, I appreciate your content. This is what you've put out. 
and I just wanted to share my thoughts. You know, and, and a great way to build networks on that, absolutely. I mean, imagine if we had access to that. Uh, game changer. Wasn't that yeah. Now? yeah. But, you know, one of the, as well, we, so we, we, we separate out the high school students and, and yes. those and, that have qualified. Yeah. So uh, the other thing is, if you're going into business, find a mentor outside mm -hmm. South Africa as well. Don't right. only look for a mentor within South Africa. Of course, have a mentor in South Africa, but try and locate. Uh, there are mentorship programs mm. with lawyers mm. that are established. Even business people are starting mm. to think about offering their, um, their time back to younger people mm -hmm. uh, that are entering the industries on a global scale. So they, sh they should seek out those mentors outside the country and get a different get a broader perspective right uh, th so that's that's my advice don't be scared to step out and and try something new i mean look at elon musk mm -hmm. he has a case in point guy that just you know went left south africa uh he is a visionary mm. and just you, the kind of projects that he took like paypal Okay, yeah. I think only Mark, you know, you've got Mark Shuttleworth that uh, was was a similar kind of mindset. Mm. But I mean, Elon Musk is doing stuff that he would not have been able to do from South Africa. Yeah. There's just a dollar investor in dollar investment. Mm. A dollar of investment goes a long way than a rand of investment. Yeah, absolutely. And and not and and if that's on a one to one ratio, you know. It, it, it for sure i think i think and he's spoken about that a few times he's saying like i think that's one of the things not that he regrets but that it you know that saddens him that he couldn't do what he did here that's why he left that wasn't that yeah. was the only reason so i think that if we can we can look at the kids just your thoughts that have no access to study they don't have the opportunities maybe they're out of school in matric maybe they're out of school in standard eight you know just because you're ending at that and one of the things that i remember when when we first met and when i think mean, we're just out of high school or uh, you know was going to visit you and you guys were running businesses out of your bedrooms yeah you know in high school and yeah. you know servicing certain needs of specific markets and <laughs> But it was, it was, I mean, everything from pellet guns to health remedies to water pistols, these crazy things. Like, that's the thing, you know, and you start, you earned the money to start the business small. You know, what was it that, like, you know, you guys are not coming from billionaire backgrounds, right? You know, your, your folks worked hard to put a roof over your head and, and to feed you guys and the most wonderful family. But you guys were like, even before you were studying in Vos, you were flipping working, and that's why I thought gee, these guys are okay. This I've got I've got to up my game, kind of thing. So you know, for the guys, if they, you don't have access to university or like most of the country, what's your thoughts on that? So you have to create your own opportunity. Mm. Uh, you've got to. If, if I look at an analogy, if I use an analogy in law, uh, if you're trying to go after a client to, to be your client and, and, and mm. you know, you, you're generating revenue from there, I say be your own client. In other words, form a company if you've got a good idea mm. and be your own client, meaning uh, create your opportunities. Don't rely on s the, mm. the state to give you opportunities. Life is difficult. It's not like we, uh, like it was easier 40 years ago mm. when, as you say, starting up small businesses and what have you. It's harder now. And um, I th if, I, if I recall, um, one should look at resources i think it was even investec had some program for small businesses right uh, that I, I i learned of um, when i was there uh, last so speak to people understand where you can get small business loans 
get find an advisor that can help you uh, mm. access a small business loan. Right. Um, but but absolutely don't rely on anybody else except yourself. And that's something that we were uh, brought up to believe and also brought up to foster. And it's yes. just, it's, it's, you're responsible for your own success. And I think with, with that, that responsibility comes down to, as, as you alluded to earlier, how you utilize those funds, right? You know, there, there's a, a story in South Africa of a young man who was given a fully equipped petrol station, fully stocked, full tanks, the, the shops, all of that. And he basically didn't, th there wasn't the training where he was advised on what to do. So as soon as money come, was coming in, he thought, this is great, but it wasn't buying stock. You weren't making 10 Rand from a packet of chips. You were making 50 cents. But spending that, yeah. and, and within a few months, the, the business was nearly gone. And I think what, what kept him going, if I'm not mistaken, was the rental income from the, the other stores that were there. And he was able to put the brakes on and turn it around. But, you know, being, being financially literate and financially aware is just as important. And I think one of the other things that the youth or anyone needs to focus on is your name and your integrity are the most valuable things that you own. Yes. Your reputation. Yes. So it's not about fake it till you make it, being flash, you know, um, trying to say you can do things when you can't, you know, yes. sure, you know, commit to a project, but then make it happen. So those are the things like rep how important for you in business. I mean, it's a crazy question, but for, for the viewers, how important is reputation? It is the single most mm. important thing in business. Yeah. The single most important thing, because it's a long and hard road up, but a very quick road down. Right. And inevitably, people are going to, they're going to see through you if you are mm. spinning stories. Mm -hmm. um, credibility, reliability, uh, those are the two, and, and honesty are the mm. three key pillars uh, in, in, in doing business. It's fundamental. Mm. Absolutely. And, and that's like fight for that with everything that you've got, you know, yes. your, your reputation, your credibility is your oxygen. Yes. Yeah, 100%. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely right. So I'm, 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 I'm bullish as a sound South Africa. Um, I don't know how many of your listeners have actually been to China, but um, yeah, I was it's, gonna, it's an, can we touch amazing, on that? It's, 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 it's uh, what really opened my eyes. Um, mm. I, I'd gone there a couple of years ago. I spent a few months there and I took trains uh, from north to south, east to west. It sounds like I had a bit of an adventure. I did. Mm. I went like, we could say the lowest class on the train, right? Mm. Uh, like four bunk beds in a compartment on the one side for another. Uh, and that's the average person uh, that traveled. But mm. I saw the country, I saw a lot of the country from the perspective of the average person. Right. Uh, what I also saw, I obviously went on high speed trains. I, I think mm. they would go like 300 kilometers an hour or something ridic ridiculous. But the wealth in the world is not in the Western uh, or Northern, um, it's, it's not in the Hemisphere. North, it's not in North mm. America. Mm. The wealth is in China. Uh, those, there are more billionaires probably than mm. America. Uh, there's more wealth. The cities that are being developed so quickly. Uh, it's just, you don't see it. Where you, where you go to Detroit and you go to, um, you, you go to inner American cities, you see a lot of decay. China is just flourishing. Mm. The, the, the buildings, the, the way that um, infrastructure gets developed, it's, it's incredible. And they're smart, good people. 
and yes. incredibly hardworking. I mean, it's a work ethic that has blown me away. Where yeah. you know, I, I've I've had the fortunate opportunity to chat to some of the people in the powerlifting community, and it's you know like they're busy organizing competitions, they're working full days, then organizing a, 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 an a international competition, and then hopping on a call with me at eleven thirty at night with energy and enthusiasm. And I'm like, what time are you up in the morning? No, four o'clock. It's like, <laughs> got to up our game, huh? Yeah. It's yeah. wonderful. This is not nine to yeah. five. They're not nine to five. Yeah. It's, it's, it's incredible to see. Mm. Uh, and in fact, you being a, a heavily involved in sports, I mean, mm. China is focusing a lot of resources on sports mm. development. Yes. Uh, football was one when I was there, soccer at least. Mm. Um, now it, it might be other uh, areas, but mm. wow, what what smart, hardworking mm. people mm. really? They're, 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 they're excellent. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, sure. So there, there's also another another opportunity. What do you see with the relationship within Africa and China? How can that benefit South Africans wanting to work? I think we, we have a much easier road in almost. Well, I th unfortunately, I think China has an easier road into Africa. Than mm. We have an easier road than we have a road into China. China, okay. Uh, Ch China is, you know, it's it's uh, it's quite, it's, it's not as embracing. When I say embracing, it, it's, it's just not... Uh, Let's put it this way. Africa mm. needs China's capital. Mm -hmm. uh, China does not really need South African uh, capital, which it doesn't have. Yeah. But what it does need is South African expertise. Mm. Uh, so that it, it, uh, IP, in, yeah. in, in RP, it needs mm. RP. It needs people like, take a good example yourself, mm. uh, you know, or people that are, skilled in a certain uh, area of sport they need that they don't have right. that mm, mm. Uh, or they could use more at least yes i think so because so they're so committed they're looking for maximizing um what they're able to offer their people yes right. so look for okay. so if so if you if we were to give advice to youngsters uh, look for the 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 sectors mm. where where China is looking to develop more. Uh, that's coaching. We know that. I mean, yeah. China has been purchasing football clubs, uh, a lot of football clubs, just to get mm -hmm. the expertise. Yes. Absolutely. Well, that's why we're, we're going to end up there soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all may end up there. I should 100%. Have Mandarin. Yeah. I should have learned Mandarin in high school. Mandarin? I did Cantonese. Come <laughs> But you but, want to spend time you know in Hong Kong, hey? Yeah. That, that's yeah. that's another thing. Yeah. yeah. If you if 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 you if if you if I were to say what advice I can give, mm. learn Mandarin. Yeah. Absolutely learn Mandarin. Yeah. And get your kids to learn Mandarin. A hundred percent. You know, I mm. they you go there. Not much English is spoken, but why should they learn English? Yeah. One point six billion people. They don't need to learn English. Mm. Uh, they don't care about English, yeah. but if you want to, if you want to broaden your horizons, learn Mandarin. Teach, get your children to learn Mandarin. I'm a big proponent of that. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. So it's a difference between uh, Wei Ni Hao versus uh, Dojian Sai versus Shi Shi. You know, so Correct. and which Correct. I found as a struggle, who to say what to. Um, but what I found, they're very polite. <laughs> yeah. I said, uh, I said, Doji Sai to um, as thank you to uh, the customs official at the Hong Kong airport. And he's like, how long have you been here? I said, you know, like for a week. He says, yeah, but you're on the mainland now. You're not in Hong Kong. You got to, uh, it's like, okay, cool. Thank you. And then, then like, what advice do you have to help me? He said, okay, just remember where you are regionally, you know, or you can always start out with, with uh, you know, with Mandarin. And then if they're Cantonese, they'll speak to you. Um, it's amazing. It's a fa it's a lot of fun, you know. And I think so. If we look at it like you're you're 36 now, and 
<laughs> so I feel so, 36. Six, absolutely. Oh, you're looking fantastic, dude. It's awesome to see. We're 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 a similar age. And like and you you do you feel like you're just getting started, like you're having fun still? Oh, yeah, uh, 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 for sure. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm feeling energized. Mm. Uh, mm. I feel like I made a good point yes. in my life. A very, very good point. Uh, in other words, I'm not starting out. Mm-hmm. Um, I come with experience, yeah. but I still know that I've got adventures to do. That's where I am. Yeah. 100%. You know, it's like the the energy levels of a 26-year-old, the experience of a 50-year-old, and the optimism of a 12-year-old. You know, I love that's, it. You know, love the, that. Love that. You know, that's sort of where we are right now, right? 100%. Yeah. Sure. Hey, Daryl, we've taken quite a bit of your time. I'm, we'll, we'll end here. We're going to love to have you back. And then I'll just Appreciate chat to you after the recording. Um, so Perfect. I'll be back in one second. Thank you so much. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you, Nick. We, we covered it. a thanks lot. And... Oh, thank sorry. You. All right. No, I'm saying thanks for having me on. No, absolute honor. All right.